So again, thank you all for joining today. Uh, my name is Craig McInnes. I'm a co-CEO here at My Caribou. Um, My Caribou, just as brief background, is the only global partnering hub for med tech uh, for manufacturers, distributors all over the globe. So we have over 44,000 now uh, manufacturers and distributors on the platform uh, from over 125 countries. It allows you to basically match and connect with partners all over the world uh, to navigate global markets. <clears throat> There's a, a set of collaboration tools that will help you uh, work with your partners, including things like sales forecast, file sharing, and so on, as well as being able to monitor and measure your market and partner performance globally. You can sign up for free, um, and there is a link there, which we'll include in the deck as well. I'll now introduce today's speakers, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Brill in particular uh, out of the gate here because he's on Pacific time, uh, so it's 6 a.m. his time, and we really appreciate him getting up early and, and uh, doing this so that we could really cover a lot of time zones today. Um, so uh, uh, let me introduce uh, Jason Slotnick first. Uh, Jason is uh, a principal and founding um, uh, member of Policy Strategies. Sorry, folks, my, um, just give me half a second here. There we go. Um, and counsels clients on Medicare and Medicaid coverage, payment reimbursement, coding, and government policies. He has experience leading pre and post launch strategies, as well as life cycle management tools for pharmaceutical, biotech, diagnostic, and device manufacturers. Thank you for joining today, Jason. And Dr. Brill is the chief medical officer at Predictive Health and has over 30 years of experience providing strategic leadership and medical oversight uh, to large data-driven health organizations. He's skilled in strategy, development, and implementation of innovative health programs, products, and payment systems with extensive experience in clinical practice, research, coverage, reimbursement, quality improvement, data analysis, and value-based care. So let me pass it over to uh, Jason to get started. Good morning. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Uh, and I should also say good afternoon and good night, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, a couple of opening quick thank yous, first of all, to my Caribou, uh, to Craig and Melanie for this opportunity and for really providing tremendous support in putting this presentation together. And of course, special thanks to my co-presenter, Dr. Joel Brill, who really put together these slides and has been a good friend and colleague of mine for 20 some odd years. As you can see from the pictures Craig showed up, showed on <laughs> earlier on, things have changed over the last couple of years. Uh, for us. And so while Joe and I are sort of independent, we work very closely together. Uh, we have our own companies, but we, we collaborate on many, many projects. And I also am a uh, subject matter expert within the Bioport Network. Some of you who've been on previous presentations through my caribou may have seen Mark Lesseroth and Bioport. And that's all to say that there are plenty of different ways for you to access and reach us with your market access and reimbursement questions. And with that in mind, here are what Joel and I are going to try to uh, give you a little bit of the tip of the iceberg today, are these three fundamental principles of how do I make money in America with my technology. And those are coverage, coding, and reimbursement. And I'm going to cover the, code, the coverage aspect, and Dr. Brill is going to cover the coding and the reimbursement uh, aspect of to this morning's afternoon and evening's presentation. So I think we want to go first to a poll question. I'm going to turn it back to Craig, and I'll just remind everybody, there's no cheating here, okay? No Google. Don't phone a friend. Here's the first question. Go ahead, Craig. 510 clearance is the quickest and most affordable way to enter the U.S. market, true or false? And we'll give you a second to answer. And then Angela will post the results here momentarily. Okay. All right. 57% oh. true, 43% false. Survey says, go ahead, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> so false. Um, 510K clearance is uh, the reality. Payers need evidence-based endpoints that are not necessarily required for a 510K. And what we're going to describe that in much more detail when we get into the coverage paradigm. Um, but I'll tell a little bit of story, right, to sort of root us in why this is false and then the coverage presentation. I've worked for many years here in, in the swamp, as, as it's been affectionately 
called the last couple of years uh, interacting with Medicare. What Medicare says, what CMS program, specifically the individuals who run the program say, you can't go to the FDA and do a 510K and say to the FDA, there's nothing to see here. I'm a predicate device. I'm very similar to something you've already approved. I need to get on the market as quickly as possible. And then show up at CMS's doorstep and say, I need premium reimbursement. I need to get paid a lot more than anybody else. I've got the greatest technology since, you know, the bread slicer. And that's true, and that makes sense inherently for a reimbursement system where you don't have to generate a lot of evidence to get onto the market and then expect robust payment. So what this slide and then the subsequent slides that I'm going to present on coverage are aiming to teach is that, yes, 510K is great, but especially as we move greater and greater into healthcare being a greater and greater portion of spend in this country, evidence that is not required for your 510K approval is actually what you will need and need to generate in order to be successful with a coverage, a unique code, and maximum reimbursement. So let's get on to the next slide. And this slide sort of captures that unique paradigm of while these are all separate coding, coverage, payment, they are really tied together in terms of a successful commercial launch and a successful strategy. Layered in on those three, coverage, coding, and payment, of course, is your payer mix and your site of service because that generates sort of what evidence you need to generate. Is your payer mix mostly going to be a commercial payer, a Medicare payer? They serve different patient populations. They're going to want to see different data. And as Joel will go into in great detail, the site of service drives what kind of coding you will need and therefore what kind of price point you can have upon entry and then how you can increase or rebating off of that entry price because of the site of service that your item or technology or service provides. So, Craig, let's go to the next slide here. And we're going to start building upon that slide, that puzzle piece that we showed. Coverage, coding, payment, as you can see here. Now, just because you have one doesn't mean you have the other, right? Coding does not guarantee that you have coverage. All coding does is say you have a code. And a code is just that. It's an alphanumerical code, and Joel's going to go into this in a lot more detail, that sort of is a communication tool for what service was provided or what item was provided. And the code, as you can see here, does not guarantee reimbursement. It just links the coverage and the payment. And the payment is a function of the coding and the coverage. And coverage, as I'm going to get into, is not guarantee adequate reimbursement. In other words, there's a big difference between coverage and access. So, Joel, did you want to comment in here a little bit? Okay. No, Let's we'll, go we'll, on to we'll this. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit further in the moments to come. Okay. So, now, I'm going to dive into the weeds on coverage. What is coverage in its essence and its heart? You are the payer. You have this new item. You have this new service. How am I, what criteria am I going to use to judge whether or not I should pay for this? That's what coverage is. It's pretty simple. It's those terms and conditions used by payers to determine whether I should pay for this. The next layer of that analysis, the first one really is, is this medically necessary to diagnose or treat the patient's condition? There are preventative, and, like vaccines and glaucoma screening, mammographies, all of that, that is a separate analysis to some extent, and perhaps for a different webinar, but right now we're not focused on preventative or screening services, we're focusing on coverage for a medically necessary, next slide please, Craig, item or service. And that really fits into this slide, right? To think of it as the patient journey. The patient presents somewhere, right? Going back to that first slide, side of service, they have signs and symptoms of a disease, something is wrong, they are treated, and as you see on this slide, the patient is the center, and then from there is a decision tree. 
And this decision tree works for a lot of the different stakeholders in the healthcare system and should be thought through and understood and appreciated by the innovator, you guys here on the webinar. You are introducing an item or an introducing a new service into this paradigm. So appreciating how it fits in the patient journey, how it fits in sort of the payer's mindset of whether or not I should pay for this, whether or not I should cover this, is an important way to be able to strategically present the value of your technology and make it covered. So let's go in and give you some tips on how to get to that coverage, the road to coverage. Provide adequate evidence that a treatment using the new technology compared to alternatives or the incremental information obtained by the new technology compared to other alternatives. In the med device world, for a long time, much more so to some extent than drugs, this comparative nature driving coverage has existed. So when you have a new item, or you're providing an item within a new service, being able to differentiate as a comparator to something that's already on the market, not necessarily a placebo or whatever that may be, is very important to generate that evidence for coverage. Does it change a physician's recommendation? That's what the payer wants to know. How does it impact clinical decision-making? How does it impact the patient journey? These data points, these evidences, this evidence is really important in generating coverage, putting you in a position to negotiate for coverage, and then everything from reimbursement falls into place. Next slide, please. Coverage. How is that then ultimately decided? So you're presenting, you have all this evidence, you have your FDA approval. Now, what is the mindset of the payer in doing this coverage, making this coverage analysis? And as you can see here in the bottom of the pyramid, most new covered products are paid just by having the claim paid for, and there's no formal decision-making process. National coverage decisions are done by Medicare program. They only do maybe 10 a year, and you really don't want to be there. It's not a good strategy to come to the states and say, I'm going to get a Medicare national coverage decision, and I know I'll be covered. That is a flawed approach. I'll be very honest and very transparent. The reason being, it takes CMS years to go through it. It has to be of something of significant importance. And it is really a barrier to coverage because if it's ongoing, it creates uncertainty in the marketplace. And you don't know how it's going to go. Similarly, with local coverage decisions, there are different areas of the country that are managed by CMS subcontractors that cover a variety of states. Think of it as and the national coverage is sort of the Supreme Court, and then you have local courts that make coverage decisions. Those are called Medicare administrative contractors. Similarly, they are resource challenged, and they don't make a lot of local coverage decisions, leaving you with the bottom pyramid, which is it's covered through claims. And the way to accelerate that and make those claims go through and have coverage just build goes back to what we just said before related to evidence generation and making sure you have good and robust evidence because, next slide please, this is what the evidence goes to show, goes to prove. CMS is a agency. It is ruled by laws that Congress passes. And the first bullet, if you know nothing else, about coverage is the first, is the most important bullet. CMS sits there in their policies, what they are told to do is cover an item or a service that is reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of a, for a Medicare beneficiary. The next layer of that onion is the next bullet. If it's safe and effective, FDA approval really helps. So these are, this is the fundamental essential criteria for coverage. FDA approval and then the robust data off of that FDA approval then fits into the commercial success as we discussed a few minutes ago. So I, you guys are going to have access to the slides. I'm not going to read all of the points here. I'm just highlighting the, the important parts of each slide. 
Greg, next slide. This slide gives you further verbiage around the concept of that pyramid that I showed a few minutes ago about how coverage decisions are made, the hierarchy of the impact of those coverage, right? National, as the name says, is national. Local is for that local jurisdiction. And this next two bullets really give you more process. Right? Our federal government is a lot about process, more about how the process goes for a national coverage assist, uh, decision and sometimes a local. In other words, advisory committees are brought in to help make that coverage decision process. Next slide. Latin, another slide on sort of the process, another slide on sort of how this all works from a jurisdictional point of view. Local, right, again, different sections of the country, and they also make coverage decisions. Now, this is for medical devices, so the focus of this, and therefore it's covered under Medicare Part B as in boy, and A as in apple. There's different parts of Medicare, and I should have said this up front, we are focusing on the medical benefit today. Parts A and Parts B. Medicare also covers self-administered prescription drugs. That's for a separate webinar. That's not governed by these national coverage decisions or locals. These are items and services, devices, medical benefit. Next slide. So going back to peeling that onion of what evidence I need this slide gives you some of those ideas on, okay, I need to generate the evidence. I know how to get covered generally, but how do I really get good access? What evidence do I need to generate and where should I have that evidence published? What kind of study design should I do? What do the payers want to see and how do they want to see that evidence being generated? That's what this slide covers. RCTs, randomized controlled clinical trials, Right, study and design, that's the gold standard that most payers look for. Sometimes it's not practical, right, especially in the med device world. Um, so that's why we mentioned head-to-head -head is, is a very good barometer in its place. So the principles of coverage are represented here on this slide, sort of what evidence you need, uh, Guidelines, expert opinions. The last one I want to talk about before I turn it over to Joel to deal with coding and payment is the health economic and outcome research. That has gained a lot of momentum from the payer's point of view because going back to what we talk, talked about a little bit about comparative analyses, am I better? Because that's not part of the FDA approval process, right? All you need to show is somewhat that you're similar to as a predicate you don't need a lot of data to demonstrate how you are different. So the presupposition of the payer is you are the same. So my closing comment on coverage is you need to generate the evidence to get the payer off its mindset coming in when it sees a 510K approval that you are the same. And with that, Joel, I'll turn it over to you for any comments on coverage and then take it away on coding and payment. Well, let's go forward so that we can give folks the opportunity to ask questions later. Um, so as Jason mentioned beforehand, the holy trinity is coding coverage and reimbursement. What is coding? Coding is a mechanism to identify what you do. Coding can identify the procedure that you perform. Coding can identify the diagnoses that you perform these procedures for. Uh, there are multiple coding systems and reimbursement in the US is highly tied to coding. Next, please. There's different types of codes. Many of you around the globe are familiar with the International Classification Diseases or the ICD-10 system. Uh, the US is st stuck in ICD-10. We recognize that other parts of the world are already at 11, um, but there can be diagnoses codes. Uh, there can be procedure codes. Um, when procedures are performed in the hospital setting. Um, there can be codes for drugs, for devices, for procedures performed by physicians or their healthcare professionals. Just recognize that just because a code exists is not a guarantee that there will be payment. And just because something has been approved by the FDA does not 
mean that it automatically will receive a code. Next, please. Um, the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System uh, was established in the last century. <laughs> Get to say that one. It's a standardized way to describe items or services provided. Um, there were revisions um, almost two decades ago, um, which made HICPIC mandatory with the implementation of HIPAA in the United States. Um, and again, the existence of a code uh, does not determine coverage or non-coverage. Next, please. Um, level one HICPIC codes are maintained by the American Medical Association, current procedural terminologies uh, described physician and other provider services. Level two codes are used primarily to identify products, supplies, and services not included in the CPT codes. For the most part, most uh, level two HICPIC codes are maintained and distributed by Medicare uh, with some exceptions. For example, the D or dental codes are maintained by the uh, American Dental Association. Next, please. Um, CPT, the AMA basically has the franchise on creating CPT codes. Um, sometimes you hear terms about Category codes, category one codes are those that are clinically recognized, generally accepted services. Category two codes are really for quality measurement, performance measurement. And category three codes are tracking codes. They're temporary. Uh, they have a five-year lifespan, although they can be expanded and extended, forgive me, for emerging technology services and procedures. Next, please. So how is a new code developed? You come up with an idea. You can be a manufacturer, can be a provider, can be a specialty society, could be a payer, anybody can come up with an idea. Um, you develop a coding application. Uh, the application gets submitted to the AMA. It's reviewed by the staff. It's then reviewed by specialty advisors representing over 110 different uh, specialty societies. It then goes to the panel. In fact, the next Editorial panel meeting is coming up this week, this Thursday through Saturday in Seattle, Washington. The panel can make several decisions. It can accept, it can modify, it can reject an application, or it can table an application to time certain to the next meeting or time uncertain to a meeting in the future. Next, please. Um, if a code is accepted, and if you get a category one code, this then goes to the next process, which is called the AMA's Relative Value Update Committee, or the RUC. Uh, the RUC is not a federal advisory committee. It is actually the private sector, the AMA and the specialty societies, who are expressing their rights to comment to Medicare. Uh, the RUC process basically starts with a code, a category one code, um, which has been passed by the editorial panel. Um, the specialty societies then indicate if they have any level of interest in surveying the code. If the code is surveyed for physician work time, practice expense, that's equipment, staff, and supplies needed to provide the service in both a non-facility, that's a physician office, as well as a facility, such as a hospital or an ambulatory surgery center setting, as well as professional liability insurance or malpractice. Um, the survey results um, are then discussed with that specialties um, advisory committee, and then those are presented to the RUC. The RUC meets three times a year. Uh, the RUC then again, accepts, modifies, or rejects the recommendations. The RUC's recommendations are then transmitted to Medicare and Medicare takes those comments under advisement when Medicare issues a proposed rule um, during the cycle. Uh, note several things. One, the manufacturer or industry does not participate in the RUC process. And number two, Basically, again, the RUC is simply advisory, okay? Medicare observes the CPT meetings, Medicare observes the RUC meetings, but Medicare CMS does not have an actual seat that is a voting seat on either of those two meeting processes. Next, please. 
Um, there will be a, obviously a, a quiz on this at the end of the day. Um, this is from Medicare. It's the decision tree as to whether you'd like to um, add you know, a new HCPCS code. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm really not gonna go through all the parts of this other than to say that, you know, does an existing code currently exist that describes your product uh, technology? If yes, there's no need for a new code. If no, um, it then goes through this process of whether or not um, you would need a HCPCS code. Um, the CPT meetings occur three times a year uh, for um, products that get a HCPCS code. CMS has two meetings a year. And then for drugs, um, Medicare can make a decision on a quarterly basis. Next, please. Ah, poll question two. All right, Angela, let's post the question. Same rules, no cheating, right, Craig? <laughs> exactly. Uh, payment is automatic for existing and appropriate codes. True or false? And we'll give everyone a minute to answer and Angela will post the results. That was quick. 11% true, 89% false. And? Hey, okay. very, <laughs> very good. So correct, the answer is, the answer is false. Um, not all products and technologies are separately payable. Coverage policies, whether it's from the payer, whether it's from Medicaid, Medicare, or the like, frequently dictate which technologies are payable. Some products may be part of another procedure and may not be eligible for separate reimbursement. And again, coding is not reimbursement. It is an element of reimbursement. Next, please. So we're gonna, in the last few moments, go over payment mechanisms. And probably, you know, for those of you who have not dealt with the US system, your eyes are spinning. And those of you who have dealt with the US health system, your eyes and your ears are spinning by now. Um, there are a variety of different payment mechanisms. Um, there can be mechanisms for the hospital inpatient setting, for the hospital outpatient setting, for physician services, as well as for laboratory services. At a high level, um, hospital inpatient um, is developed by Medicare um, and it's based on diagnosis-related groups. Hospital outpatient, which includes ambulatory surgery center settings. Medicare groups similar procedures into ambulatory payment classifications, which are based on clinical and resource coherence. For physician services, physicians and other uh, qualified healthcare professionals like psychologists, social workers, uh, audiologists, physical therapists, nurse practitioners, physician assistants and like are paid off of the Medicare physician fee schedule. Um, and that commercial payers oftentimes will pay the healthcare professional at some percentage of the physician fee schedule. Um, and then laboratory is a whole nother interesting thing. Laboratory services, Medicare establishes a clinical laboratory fee schedule. Um, commercial payers oftentimes may pay um, a percentage of the laboratory fee schedule. Um, what happened in the US about eight years ago was PAMA, the Protecting Access to Medicare Act in 2014. And what PAMA did is basically said that if Medicare was paying a higher amount than what commercial payers were paying, that the Medicare payment would drop by a certain percentage over time and over a period of years until it achieves equilibrium with the commercial marketplace. So obviously the goal of that was to make sure that Medicare was not paying the most for clinical laboratory services. Next, please. Um, the Medicare physician fee schedule is a budget neutral system. Um, and we go back to the discussion a few moments ago about the uh, RUC process, a relative value is assigned to each service to capture the physician work, the malpractice, and the direct and indirect or overhead practice expenses involved in furnishing the services. If you do your service in a physician office or non-facility setting, reimbursement is going to be higher because the physician incurs the cost 
of the equipment, supplies, and staff needed to perform the procedure. The physician reimbursement is less if the procedure is performed in the hospital setting because the hospital is now being paid separately for the equipment, staff, and supplies needed to perform their services. So the physician then in those facility settings is only paid for their professional services. And as mentioned, again, um, the RUC develops inputs and values by survey data. They do not look at existing claims data. Um, and again, the RUC is simply an advisory committee which provides information, including invoices and equipment and supplies back to Medicare. In the outpatient setting, um, outpatient services and procedures, as we've mentioned, are grouped under the outpatient prospective payment system into ambulatory payment classification groups. Uh, there are certain rules, clinical coherence, so obviously neurosurgery procedures would be grouped with other neurosurgery procedures and unlikely to be grouped with, for example, urology or cardiology or psychiatry services. And there are also rules in terms of payment so that the codes that are grouped within an APC um, have to be within this two times uh, uh, rule, which is uh, described here, and you can read this in further detail. Medicare uses data from hospital cost reports to determine the geometric mean cost for each services and procedures within each APC group. Um, these are adjusted for variations in labor costs across geographic areas or are over 800 APCs. And key thing to think about this is that the physician fee schedule is budget neutral. Physician fees drop year over year. Uh, the OPPS fee schedule um, fluctuates with the consumer price index, which means if you've been tracking that over time, you will see that payment for services in the hospital setting, uh, outpatient hospital setting, have continued to increase by several percentage points year over year. Joel? Next, please. Joel? Yes, sir. Um, we had a question in the in the uh, chat about what is covered in, in a DRG, so I'll, I'll handle that. Um, DRG stands for Diagnostic Related Group, and as Joel mentioned, that's in the inpatient setting, and it's a bundle payment, and it covers everything that is performed to the patient while the patient is in the hospital. Uh, so, picture it this way: I I am admitted to the hospital. I have, you know, we all know this sort of as an experience to some extent, and a, claim, a chart is developed for me, a record of everything that's being performed to me and for me. There are ICD-10 codes in all of this, and then when I am discharged, that claim is submitted to CMS. CMS has a software system behind the scenes here that looks at ICD-10 codes, both diagnosis and procedures and items performed to me, and then sort of moves that claim into the appropriate payment DRG and pays the hospital. And it works very similar in the hospital outpatient setting, as Joel just described with ambulatory payment classifications. But the inpatient setting, the outpatient setting are bundled payments overwhelmingly for med tech items and then those services that use med, med tech items. You are, I don't want to use the word stuck, but stuck <laughs> inside a bundle payment. And that's what a DRG is. It's really a bundle payment that is paid and the payment varies based upon items and services performed and also where the hospital is located in the country. Hospitals in Alabama get paid less than hospitals in, in New York, for example, for performing the same uh, procedures, and then hospitals that have um, medical students get paid more. There's a lot of different aspects in it, but fundamentally, a DRG is a bundle payment. So, Joel, back to you and bring us home. I think we are almost there. Next slide. So, I guess the question is, if you build it, will they come? Um, there's two ways of looking at this. From the patient perspective, are the risks of your, your new procedure, your new device 
are they acceptable? Um, if treatment fails, what will the patient, what will the provider do next? What are the options? If insurance doesn't cover it, what's the cost? Clearly, um, if you've got something that is in the range of a couple of a hundred, a couple of thousand dollars, it's very different than if you've got something where your price point is $20,000, $50,000 or more. Patients also look at, is it essential? Are there options that insurance will pay for? Okay, um, you may be aware that in the States and commercial, um, we have seen a trend over the past decade that more people are enrolled in high deductible health plans. That means that the patient may have an out-of-pocket um, of $3,000, $5,000, $8,000 individual, $16,000 in a family member that they have to pay before insurance kicks in. From a provider perspective, doctors and others are creatures of habit. Will I get paid? How hard is it to perform this procedure using your technology? How long does it take? Does it allow me to do more things in a quicker amount of time? Or does it really require me to take a longer amount of time to use your technology? What's the learning curve? How many procedures do I need to be able to perform until I'm feeling pretty confident with performing the procedure? Will this have an impact on my malpractice rates? What other resources will I need to do the service? Will I need, can I do the service in my office setting or will I need to go to a hospital or an ambulatory surgery center in order to perform the procedure? Next, please. Okay, so let me jump in just quickly. Um, just as you're as you're putting questions in, um, so please put those in the Q and A panel. We're about to get into the Q and A portion of the presentation. Um, as we're doing that, I just want to remind you of an upcoming webinar Tuesday, September twenty eighth, uh, around building successful U.S. distribution, sales, and marketing strategies. So we're continuing the the theme of the U.S. market, obviously being the largest market in the world, and we've got uh, uh, two great speakers lined up. Uh, for that. That's the 28th of September. Um, I, I think Angela will probably post if she hasn't already a, a link to sign up for that. Uh, again, if you even if you can't attend, sign up because you'll get the deck and the, uh, the audio as well. Um, so as, we, as again, as we're just going to line up some questions here, we had some come in in advance of the presentation today. And I thank you for those. And I'll go through some of those right now. Um, feel free to put questions in the Q&A panel as well. And if we don't get to all of them, we will send a follow-up uh, with answers to any remaining questions. So I'm going to start off with a couple that came in uh, in advance of the of the webinar. And just as I'm just before I do that, you know, there's a, a lot of great content here, you guys. You did an amazing job uh, keeping on on track and covering a lot of material very quickly. And I think the uh, the content of the deck, which we'll send to everyone. Uh, we'll give everyone additional information. So let's start with the first question. Uh, in the future, will more codes be made accessible to more clinicians? For example, our software and hardware is being used by occupational therapists who can't access some codes. They need to be cleared by a medical doctor. So I'll throw it to both you guys and you can chime in. Okay, Joe. Um, I'll start with that. So the part of the problem is that um, certain types of healthcare professionals may be limited um, by virtue of their state licensure or Medicare um, aspect as to the types of services that they can report. Um, Medicare may have one set of rules um, and a commercial payer like a Blue Cross or Aetna, Cigna, or the like, may have a different set of rules um, as to the services that an occupational therapist, or for that matter, an other therapist, like a physical therapist or a speech language pathologist may be able to report. Um, so this is not a coding question per se, it's really right. more of a regulatory, um, you know, licensure question um, and the like. Um, that being said, over the last several years time, there have been uh, several new CPT codes um, 
primarily category three, although there have been some category one codes that have come out as well. And when those codes come out, um, the AMA tries to give careful consideration as to who would be um, performing the services because if a code is assigned to it, that assignment of a code into a certain section of CPT may either facilitate or preclude the ability of a non-physician healthcare professional uh, to report those services. Jason, what else, if anything else, would you add? No, uh, I, I agree. Um, and, you know, in the interest of time, let's get some more questions, right? If the, the, whoever presented that question, we can always do a follow-up, as you said, Craig. Now, I just want to make sure you know, Craig, there's a question in the in the Q&A from the, so yeah. I leave it up to you to determine when we, when we answer those questions. Yeah, I think we're good on time here. So I'll hit, I'll hit a few more of the um, questions yep. in advance. And then again, everyone is, if you have additional questions, keep throwing those into the Q&A uh, uh, panel there and, and we'll get to them as well. Um, so the second question here is, can you speak to reimbursement for maternity care and women's products? Um, so, I mean, that's a, Go on, go on, Jason. Um, that's a good question. Uh, it, it's part of um, what I focus on in the beginning relates to its coverage. And coverage policies are not written to some extent based upon who the individual patient is, what category they, they are in. It's coverage policies, as we discussed, right on one level, it's about evidence. But on the other hand, it's also about um, eligibility. Are they eligible to be covered? So Medicare, right, it's 65 plus, and there might be certain services that Medicare is not going to cover that a woman may need because, right, of the age. Um, that having been said, um, recently in this administration, there's been a very concerted effort to focus on women's health specifically postpartum depression um, and other aspects of, of women's health. Uh, you're going to see a lot more of that coming into the foreground. I don't want to get into the politics of what sort of what's going on here, but the general answer to that question is that the fundamental coverage principles that we discussed early apply for, for women's health in the same way that it applies to all other items and services that would be provided to anybody with a caveat of a particular focus on certain aspects of a woman's health journey, uh, like postpartum depression of that government has felt has been uh, neglected. And I will add back to my DRG answer before that CMS is now developing this just now in August, they finalized to be effective October 1, Centers of excellence birthing centers in hospitals, even though they oversee a Medicare population that doesn't give a lot of, doesn't have a lot of births associated with it, they are getting into regulating and creating centers of excellence around uh, childbirth. So I know I said both sides of the answer. I gave two answers to that, you know, that sort of seem opposite to each other. Uh, without knowing more about where you want to go with that question, that's sort of the way it is. I'll just point out as well, we, we are going to provide contact information uh, for both panelists today. So you can also reach out directly if you want to dig in further on some of these. I, I'm going to go to the uh, online question that's sort of, sort of related to the last one. Uh, would service items like disinfection equipment and the like get put into a code? Where do infection control items come into play? So disinfection and like is, is what we call is indirect practice expense, um, and um, I'm just going to say at a high general level, it would be unlikely to achieve its own separate HICPIC code um, for reimbursement. Um, and indirect practice expense is basically, um, if you think about it, the physical plant needed to provide the services. So whether you are um, you know, disinfecting the room or disinfecting equipment or supplies, um, that's part of indirect. The only thing that I can think of where I've seen disinfection get 
specifically included in the reimbursement for a procedure is, for example, um, in the physician office setting, if someone has to, you know, use betadine as an example to clean the skin before, you know, uh, a scalpel is used to penetrate the skin. They, the, you know, that type of disinfection obviously would be captured and reimbursed uh, as part of the reimbursement for the procedure. Great. And another one uh, that came in online here. If your medical device price is above the reimbursement ceiling for the related code, is it possible for the device to still be covered if sufficient evidence is presented over other devices in the same code? Jason, you want to start with that one? <laughs> yeah. You're so, going to get some interesting feedback from us on that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th that's a great question because it really helps summarize the, the interplay between coverage coding and payment. And I'm also going to try to answer, Craig, if you don't mind, the, you know, Marlene's question about that the, the device um, is already subsumed in a CPT code. The CPT code, as Joel said, is something it, it describes. Does the, it, it's a code that ad, that describes an item or a service. And if your item or service, if that code is adequately describes your new item and service, Marlene, then you don't really need a new CPT assessment or a new CMS assessment. The code works, as we like to say. Now, that having been said to answer you, the next question you said, Craig, if your device is more than what the code is going to pay for you, the question Joel and I would ask you is, is there any way to you, for you to differentiate that device? And then you could possibly get separate reimbursement through some alternative pathways that CMS provides for new technologies. Uh, that is the way to get additional reimbursement. If it's basically the same mousetrap and you want to charge more, then the answer to that is no. You are sort of stuck in that CPT code's reimbursement. Uh, and I'll throw in there parenthetically that in order to get that new separate reimbursement, there is a substantial clinical improvement obligation of the applicant to demonstrate. Demonstrate your new mousetrap is better substantially than the current mousetrap that might be within that CPT code or APC code more generally. So I try to kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, Craig. perfect. Thank you. And Dr. Bill, anything you want to add to that, or are you? Yeah. Nothing okay. else to add. So the only the only other thing I, I'm going to add is that um, for Medicare, Medicare is not going to um, accept the argument that your device costs more, uh, therefore you should be paid more because you are offsetting other costs down the road. Mm, um, good point. Commercial, commercial is a different situation. Um, it's possible that if you've got data, not just a, you know, a thought, but if you've got hard data, you know, that shows that individuals who had your technology had fewer hospital days, fewer complications, fewer post, you know, post or post procedure, emergency department visits for things of that nature. It's possible you may be able to engage into a discussion with a commercial payer. And Craig, Excellent. do you want me to uh, just? Sorry. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah. So the next one here is: uh, can can the new device usage be charged to patients directly as out of pocket in combination? with the reimbursement of regular therapy? Mm. So the, the answer to the question is subsumed in the question itself. Pat Medicare patients are what's known are called uh, home harmless. In other words, you can't balance bill them if the item or the service is covered by Medicare. And by you, in the question, you say, well, it's already been reimbursed. That means it's already been covered. Therefore, you cannot balance bill the Medicare patient for the difference in the reimbursement. If, however, it's a cosmetic, if it's Botox, if it's something else, and you know it's not going to be covered by Medicare, there is a process that the physician goes through. It's called an ABN, Advanced Beneficiary Notice, where you're putting the Medicare beneficiary on notice 
that this may not be covered and you might be financially responsible for it, but it has to be not covered. So uh, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly. Test two, test, I pronounce, mispronouncing your name. The answer to the question is no, you can't balance bill. Okay, let me go back to a question that was submitted prior. I'm, I'm really curious with this one myself, actually. So uh, does the type of hospital, so for, for profit or not for profit, differ in their reimbursement strategies, considerations, et cetera? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I mean, hospitals... Uh, whether a hospital has investor ownership or is nonprofit and is owned by a community or a religious order, uh, they're still out to make a profit. And, and what I, I'll add to that, it's a great question. And what I will add is that um, there are numerous different types of hospital classifications in the United States, rural, urban, uh, disproportionate share hospitals and within those hospitals there are different sections that are classified differently there are rural referral centers there are critical access hospitals those different types of hospitals have different reimbursement methodologies associated with that hospital as an entity there are dedicated cancer hospitals and those hospitals that, because they have different reimbursement entities, have different flexibilities as it relates to coverage because they get reimbursed differently. And therefore, some technologies may be treated differently by that subclass of trade within that hospital because they get paid separately. Dedicated cancer hospital centers basically get made whole. They're not part of the DRG system. Critical access hospitals get reimbursed at a higher price for providing drugs. So Joel's right, I agree, right? They're all out to make money, but they some of them make money differently because their reimbursement methodologies are different, and therefore they can treat products, be early adopters or very late adopters because of those different reimbursement methodologies that sit over their particular identity. Okay, I'm going to pause there on questions. There are still others, uh, both that came in advance and uh, some that are online. But just for sake of time, I'm going to uh, we, we will answer those. We'll send them in the follow up. Uh, but uh, I'm going to pause that for now. I, I do want to quickly just ask one more poll question, and then I'm going to give you contact information for Dr. Brill and Jason. So, a quick poll question here. Uh, we're always interested in where our customers are planning to expand into within the next two years. So you can choose um, multiple uh, areas of the world here, but really curious to see what your expansion plans are. Uh, so let's go ahead and answer that quickly. And then I'm gonna post the contact information. I'll wait for Angela to post the results and interesting. So, well, I guess that makes sense at the bottom there. Uh, if you're on today's webinar, you're probably very interested in uh, in this part of the world. So. But, but uh, Craig, the question is, are they still interested? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's, it's the largest market. Nobody said it was going to be easy. Um, great. So thank you for that. And um, again, here is the contact information for uh, Jason and Dr. Brill. They've been kind enough to provide that. Feel free to reach out to them. This will be in the deck when we send it out to you as well. Um, and again, I just mentioned that you can sign up for our platform for free. I want to thank Dr. Brill and Jason for joining today. I think based on the quality questions in advance and during uh, that the topic was uh, was very well received. I, you guys did an amazing job of taking a very complex situation, distilling it down to a couple dozen slides and really presenting it uh, very, very well for us today. So thank you both.